has published more than 200 papers in the top scientific journals in the world. Uh, he's had any number, I've lost count, of about 35 of students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, he's had a very distinguished career. Uh, to be brief, uh, he did an MD, PhD combination sort of thing from 78 to 82 at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, from 2002 until 2014, uh, he was a professor of clinical neurophysiology at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, Linnaeus' uh, home, and then got recruited to the Karolinska Institute in 2014, where he's been since. And from 2002, he's maintained his appointment as an adjunct professor uh, in BBH. He's been the director of the GCRC here at uh, Penn State and had an endowed professorship in kinesiology previously. His research area has concentrated on skeletal muscles and problems with skeletal muscle in clinical settings that he's observed. And as you can see, well, you might have seen earlier, he's got a very intriguing title of the seminar today. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lawrence Larson. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And I also want to thank Dr. Parker and England and Martin for coming today and talk a little bit about our research. And uh, this is sort of a little bit of a sexy title. I can never come up with sexy titles myself, so someone has did it for me. But actually, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, acquired muscle weakness in intensive care patients. Actually, acquired myopathy is a beautiful to modern intensive care. And uh, our work has always been pivoting around skeletal muscle, and our pet protein is myosin, the most amplified genes we have in the human body. And before going into this disease, I'll give you a little bit of background, what the, the methods and so on that we're working on, and maybe also for some of you, maybe broader a little bit the perspectives about what muscle is doing. It's not only about generating force and movement, it's actually very important uh, tissue in many other ways protecting the viscera and the bone. It's an amino, it's an energy store that can be used during starvation, critical illness, etc. It's involved in thermal regulation, and not the least, being a normal hormone producer in the human body. And uh, the, the type of muscle I will talk about today is skeletal muscle, and it's also called striated muscle, and that's because the final function unit has skeletal muscle is the sarcomere. It's a repeating uh, unit that makes uh, the muscle look striated. And it's separated on both sides by C line, and in the center we have the, what's called the A band, or the myosin. And this is where the motor protein myosin is dominating. And it's actually a mechanical uh, enzyme that generates force and movement during hydrolysis, it's called ATP. And <coughs> I think uh, when this, at least when this slide was made, there are more than 17 classes of myosin. And myosin is, is expressed in any cell in the The type of myosin we are interested in is class 2 myosin. It's sort of hormones in this two headed uh, filament. And that's the type of myosin we see in skeletons. And uh, for me, uh, we've been looking on muscle function very, and actually, the, the, the Primary target was aging related to change in muscle, uh, the skeletal muscle, and this is something we started working on in the mid 70s. Trying to, try to understand which of the mechanisms underlying the aging related motor handicap and doing it in humans. Look at the vivo muscle function, try to correlate it with changes in the, in the muscle tissue. And in this type of analysis, it's very easy to find correlations, but if they're causal or not, it's very difficult to determine. So, therefore, I'm looking into next mental animal. Look on for the motor unit, the alpha motor neuron, and the muscle cells innervated by a single alpha motor neuron, the next mental model, and that led to the next step, going out into the single muscle cell, and that also made it possible to go back and look in regulation of human muscle functions. And also to extract myosin from single cells, look at myosin function, look at myosin post translation modification by using X ray diffraction. This was done in spray 8 in Japan, mass spectrometry, and other analysis. And uh, this experimental animal I talked about, the uh, single motor unit method, was actually a method that was developed in the ni late 1960s by Eric Urubai and his young student at that time, Josh Yester, not so young when this picture was taken on. And it was actually a breakthrough, so to say. It was the first one to describe the spatial organization of single motor units in a male tissue. 
And here you can see that an example of this where these glycogen depleted muscle cells or the cells uh, innervated by single more traction. And in the fast, in the slow and fast fish muscle, and this was a model that we used to try to understand what is happening during the AG in, in, at the single more human level. And then we could also find a number of changes um, in regulation muscle contraction that led me to the, this collaboration with Giovanni Salviati at Padua University. It really opened my eyes to completely new field in science and cell biology. And I will always be grateful to him. Unfortunately, he's no longer in my life. Great to it's, uh, it's a great course. But he, he introduced me to the skin fiber preparation. It's a preparation with a uh, punch hole in the, in the membrane by chemical treatment, but the contracting machinery is still intact. And in, in the way Giovanni was doing, also the sarcoplastic reticulum was intact. So he used an optical mod model of that to try to do it on the sarcoplastic reticulum calcium handling, and how that was affected by aging. And we could show these things. But also, for me, this was an eye-opener. Maybe this is a way to come back and take a look at the regulation of human muscle contraction, the single muscle cell level. And actually, Giovanni also asked me to go, or thought I should go to Rick Moss's lab in Madison, Wisconsin. I was supposed to work there for it on sabbatical in 1992. And Rick had developed a model to look on short muscle cell segments from rodents and amphibians. And actually, I, I brought with me muscle tissue from humans to Rick's lab. It was a side project I did on the side. I was not supposed to work on it, but it actually came out to work very well. And actually, here I can just show this is a human muscle biopsy, percutaneous biopsy. And then you can membrane colonized bundles, pull out single cells, attach them on one end to serve a to another end to the force transducer. And this, the length of this cell between the connectors is 1.3 millimeters, and you need another half meter. Two, two millimeters is enough, and the length of the fiber should you look at for this percutaneous biopsy is about 45 millimeters, so you get about 800 muscle cells. So you can work on that for a very long time. And it actually showed that working on these human cells worked really well, actually, even more stable, I think, than in men, in the smaller men, uh, men We could then measure the force, contractile speed and then normalize force to cross-section area, what we call specific force, or the force generating capacity. Take the cells, so solubilize, and look at the expression of different microproteins in the cell set. And once again, this was driven by trying to understand aging and baby changes in the skeletal muscle contraction at the muscle cell level. But at the muscle cell levels, there are many other modulators as well that affect contraction. So then we went one step further and set up a single cell in vitro pilotex, where we take one muscle cell, Extract uh, the myosin in high salt solution, flush the chamber, and myosin will stick to the ceiling and the floor of the chamber. And then you can, uh, so here you have the muscle cell, and here you have the myosin strip at different parts of the chamber. And then you rock uh, dead myosin hands, and then after that you add progression to label active proteins. And when you add ATP, myosin will stop moving. And then you see these moving active filaments, then, then you can track them frame by frame and then measure the speed by which they are moved, which is a molecular analog to the maximum loss of the we showed that we measure at the single cell. Then we get an idea of the catalytic properties of myosin and the process determined by the isoform. Later on, we also try to understand the force generating capacity of myosin by adding a myosin binding. So an actin binding protein in increasing concentration where the slope of this curve is indicator of the force generating capacity of the And then when we look at the catalytic properties in regional ability speed and look at the different isoforms expressed in humans, the slope of the just fast isoforms, there's basically no overlap between these isoforms. Primarily determined by the isoform. The overlap you have the muscle cells code expressing more than one isoform. When you look at force though, it's a huge overlap. And it's the same at the muscle cell level. But slow myosin on average is with the fast myosin. And this is the same as I said at the single cell level, indicating this is actually a biological uh, fact. It's not due to the preparation itself. So now I'll come back to what I really want to talk about today. It's actually muscle wasting and muscle weakness, which has a strong impact on morbidity, mortality, and quality of life in many patients' diseases. And we can go from aging 
because it's a dominant factor underlying uh, fall and fall related accidents in the elderly. Cancer cachexia, I think the cancer cachexia accounts for 30% of the mortality in patients with uh, cancer because patients cannot respond to chemotherapy, uh, uh, radio, radiotherapy, radiotherapy, and it causes many other conditions as well. I'm not, I'm not to talk about this critical illness. The important thing though is to understand, at least in my mind, muscle wasting is not the uniform condition. The underlying mechanism of the specific for these different conditions. So just blowing out the size of the muscle is not a good treatment, at least in my mind. I have to go for the magnet uh, that underlying the muscle weakness in these different conditions if you want to look for want to go for the inefficient type of treatment. That's something uh, I think Big Pharma really doesn't agree upon, but um, I think I'm right. <coughs> Excuse me if I'm watching here. It's not just bear with me. I'll drink some water out of the back. So <coughs> but ICU is sort of probably the fastest discipline in modern, uh, uh, in modern hospitals. In the past, ICU births have accounted for about 3% of hospital births. In 2020, it's supposed to be 30% of all hospital births. And this is due to different things. First, it's a much higher turnover of patients in modern hospitals than it used to be. It's also the development of technology and understanding in ICUs, and not the least, actually, using evidence-based medicine and taking out interventions that can be used in, in critical care that are more harmful than healthy to the patients, and that has increased survival significantly. But modern critical care also has to go beyond just uh, looking at the critical care as improvement in survival rate. It's also what comes after, what to do for patients, etc. And I'm going to talk about two specific conditions. The first one was really called acute orthopedic myopathy. I think has more than 10 different names. The most common today is critical illness myopathy. And this was actually described the first time in the Lancet 1977 by, by Paul and Rosenthal. It's a case report about a young woman with a status asthmaticus attack that came to the emergency room. Uh, but it's, she could not be cured and in the ER, she was transferred to the ICU. There she was giving massive doses of steroids. She was also hooked up to the ventilator to ensure oxygenation of the central nervous system. And uh, in these times, uh, neuromuscular blockers were frequently used so the patient did not work against it that week. But the infection was cured, about, uh, cured after one week, and the week on the ventilator was initiated, it was found that she was fully conscious, she had intact sensory function, that she was completely orthopedic paralyzed. And, uh, and then uh, it took about three or four months, and then she was uh, at least partially mobile and recovered fully. And then this was developed as a rare condition of the end now we know this is the most common cause underlying acquired muscle paralysis in a non intensive treatment patient. And it's characterized by this general muscle weakness, intact sensory and cognitive functions. And patients can typically communicate with facial expressions. Sometimes they still hooked up with the ventilator, the tracheostomy, so they can't talk. And prognosis is relatively good if patients who have to find the disease. I heard about this disease by accident when George, Mac, uh, George Carpenter at that time was the head of the, the Montreal Neurologic Center. He came to Carpenter Caring the Hospital. We had just set up a single fiber contractor uh, uh, technique in, in my lab. He passed the lab and he said, wow, this could have been a perfect technique to study the patient on this. And he described the patient like this. And these patients have been misdiagnosed for decades as an acquired neuropathy because we have misinterpreted the negative physiological signals and still doing so. But he did something no one else had done before. He took a muscle biopsy and did a electromicroscopy. And then he found the C lines, as you remember, was separate the sophomores, and in the center there was no apex, there was no motor protein. So not so surprising the patient was paralyzed. At least I didn't forget about this, and I was on board Christmas 95. I was asked to come to a different hospital in the Stockholm region. They had an old woman with a generalized muscle paralysis. Uh, I know the neurologist there very well. He's very careful. He's done in CT, MRI, took a spinal fluid. He didn't fit with anything. So it was uh, described as an uh, unspecific Guillain-Barres an acquired neuropathy. But he wanted me to go there and do our electrophysiological tricks. And they actually indicated that 
specific mode for action order. But I haven't forgot about this. I also took a muscle biopsy, went back to the lab, we dissected a single muscle cell. This is from the other side. Uh, the cell is not activated, it is maximum activated. And there is these cells develop the same force as in an impact vector. This is from the patient. And it really doesn't take a very hard to see something is wrong here. And when you activate these muscle cell segments, they develop zero force. And then we solidify them around the moment. Yeah, these are signal cells expressing slow myosin. This is a perception from the muscle to the muscle. And then we have three isoforms, a slow and This is from the patient. Signal cells, they're quite atrophic as well as we didn't see in myosin, but then we know the bone was a 10 to 25. We still don't see any bones. <coughs> And then we load it on a different uh, uh, gel system. We can also look at smaller proteins. So one, two, and three here is from a patient with a hemiparesis, outside of the paralysis due to sample lesion in the brain. And then we look at the theoretical, non theoretic side. We see a full expression of pectoral proteins. In this patient, we see no pectoral proteins. The pectoral proteins are actually acting and recognizing this. And then just by looking around. We found uh, 11 patients in our time and so on. So, and uh, nowadays I see probably one patient a week in our hospital. And that is still an underestimate. And this is just an E, I'm showing the same thing on this first patient C line, C line in the, in the normal control, A bar. C line, C line, no A. <coughs> so then we started looking around and we also followed the patient during our recovery. And this is a patient I thought we would never see again. A patient from whom a muscle biopsy was taken one month before it went into the ICU. And he also recovered fully, uh, fully and also had to survive a massive microbial infarction with the ICU state. But these two patients have been in, uh, in common. They have a non specified autoimmune disease. It probably means something I don't know about. But that's uh, the only thing we had in common. And this is just showing a different group during recovery. Myosin is re expressed at the salt and ice being. And the motor function comes back. And it just shows how the force comes back during the chapter and the re expression of muscle development. The problem, though, if you want to try to understand the mechanism in an ICU population, I think that's impossible. Because this is as heterogeneous as you can get. These are patients that have an under, they have an underlying disease before they come to the ICU, they have different pharmacological treatment, different age, etc. So I think it's, uh, there's a strong need to recognize. So after finding the first patient, I was very fortunate to work with a group of very proactive anesthesiologists at the Carrier's Hospital. So we pack the corner and we go down 20 kilometers south to the to the where the organ has the resources. And on the surface, they supply the practice So they had an ICU for case. So uh, what they did uh, is actually they exposed uh, pigs, which was considered to be the triggering practice, near multiple brokers, sepsis, and and in five days, we didn't see muscle wasting at least significant in any of these groups. On average, a little bit lower, but I, I also remember that uh, these are very demanding experiments and they took more than three years to complete, and they had about four pigs in each group. And they actually kept the pig alive for septic pig about five days, which I think is still a good thing. So, but anyway, so but, but on the other hand, force generating. As you remember, if we would look at the maximum force and we normalize the clinical section area of individual muscle cells, that's what we call specific force. And it should not be affected by size in itself. And, we, and all these pigs are, of course, fully seated. And this is mechanical ventilating, your muscle brokers, or the stress and sizes. Mechanical ventilation, your muscle brokers, they show the same thing no, no major atrophy and no major change in force generating capacity of fiber. When you add corticosteroids, it's also to decrease sepsis, so can you combine all of these, it's poor generating capacity goes down, down by the patients. So at that time we started working with Ed Hoffman, but then at that time had the Lord's microwave facility in the US. This was actually during the time I was here in, uh, well, ah, never mind. So this was probably when I was here at Penn State, so he did the gene array. So in the group where we had no change in muscle fiber size, which was generating to us, I think 1,475 genes went up or down significantly. And uh, I'm sort of old school, I like sort of structure and function, I think it's good. It's nice to have to forgive the healthcare as well, but for other healthcare, it can be very 
extremely great to do this, almost 1500 genes. But the good thing though is, and then we have this group, and, and, and coming back, is maybe it's not so surprising that this major shift in gene expression to still maintain structure and function because there was a protective mechanism that kicked in. And there's a reason why we don't wake up, uh, wake up after long night's sleep with muscle atrophy. There's a reason why hibernating bears, when they wake up in the spring, they wake up with almost the same muscle size in the first generation. So then at least they could they compare them with the pigs when the, the post generating capacity was compromised. And one thing that showed up all the time is that when the heat shock proteins were not upgraded, when this system was compromised, that was what post generating capacity. We thought maybe this is, this is an important thing in protecting us. And also when we looked, as you, as you said, in the patients, when facial muscles were spared uh, compared to uh, in the trunk muscles. And cranial facial muscles are very different compared to the in the trunk muscles. They have different anterologic orientations, they have different expression of contractor proteins, and they have different anterior proteins. So here again, in the, in the masseter muscle in the pig, in pigs exposed to the near muscle growth, this group is there is the sports generating capacity is well maintained with respect to muscle cell type, or it was uh, decreased by almost 50% in limb muscles. And once again, facial proteins was one of the differences here between, uh, between the cranial facial and the anterior muscles. At least we didn't forget about this, and we thought it was kind of interesting. And they're going to complete a different muscle again, which is different from uh, the and trunk muscles, is the major inspiratory muscle, the, the diaphragm. It was makes it, and it also the diaphragm function that is very important for this is what uh, determines how quickly the patient can be cleaned from the bathroom. And I'll come back to that. And then the open symbols here are controlled, specific force and slow and two different fast uh, muscle fiber types. And these are the different interventions. And now suddenly the force generating capacity has decreased dramatically, irrespective if these pigs are exposed to corticosteroid sepsis or all combined. So the, the common denominator here is mechanical ventilation per se. It's doing something to this respiratory muscle, which is different from what we see in, in the limb and trunk. So the thing is, although five days may sound long, it's too short to in, in, uh, uh, get this uh, critical illness now with the phenotype with the preferential myosin loss. It takes longer in the clinic, it takes longer than a week, and it takes longer than five days in the pigs. And when I was here at Penn State, David Bissett, who I think some of you know, he told me about the very Watkin that has this lab at Hirsch Medical Center for, very, for many, many years. He developed actually a rat model there to try to understand regulation of muscle contraction. Uh, sorry, regulation of uh, blood pressure. And this is a model he developed at Rockefeller. It's a it's a it's a pharmacologically paralyzed rodent, uh, and of course then you have to be kind of ventilate that, because otherwise it could not survive. And it took him eight years to develop this. And the commercially available ventilators cannot keep. And that's why most long-term mechanical ventilation studies on the effects of diaphragm are 12 or 18 hours. Never mentioning that the, the, the rat does or the mouse doesn't survive. Battery has kept the rat alive for 96 years. So here at least you can study the effects of mechanical ventilation per se without this confounding effect, uh, following effect on the deteriorating population. So it has a lot of pros. It can do long-term experiments. Time-resolved analysis. You can look at the whole muscle. This, of course, is much less expensive than what normally takes. And it mimics, we think, uh, the ICU condition better than any other old muscle wasting model available. And it's also well suited for intervention studies, which I'll come back to. There are cons as well. It is a complex model. It's, it's hand built, and by the proportion of commercial available, and it's demanding monitoring. It's 24 hours a day. And I was fortunate to start collaborating with, uh, I was here at Penn State. And uh, when various electrodes were failing, for some reason, typically two o'clock in the morning, we used to get me a call. And then I just got in the car, I drove out to Hershey, took out the muscles, drove back, put them in the freezer. And doing so for a number of years, we collected a fair number of uh, muscle samples from this model. <coughs> And very much to my surprise, and I'm happy, I think it actually mimics exactly what we see in patients who develop this critical illness power. This is just what we call an enzyme is the chemical staining of the lack of white, this is a special fast to store fibers. As you can see with the increase.
increasing duration of mechanical plant formation. This there's a sort of blurring of this clear distinction between this muscle cell type. And that's actually due to the production of also mice. When we look at this mice in active ratio of declines. And there's atrophy, but even more striking, force generating capacity, which is independent muscle size, has dropped to about 50% or more, which is an enormous shift. And we can also see when we look on the, uh, the mice and content in the fast fish muscle, mice and other thin bars acting on the, uh, on the open bars, there's a preferential mice and loss, and also in the slow fish muscle. And there's also dramatic transcription down the regulation sink, thing, as we see in patients, uh, at durations longer than five days. And then we can also look at the uh, uh, temporal expression or activation of the photolytic pathways have a long way to be tested. The, the only uh, photolytic pathway that pre uh, precedes actually the mice and is the ubiquitin protein system. And uh, it's followed by the autophagy and the calcium activated uh, uh, protein activation pathways. So, what, what, what is the because in these rare bats? They are not septic. They have blockers, but I think, as you saw before, blockers are not really important. And, uh, and they were not giving steroids. And, they, and there was no endogenous production of steroids or of um, corticosteroids either. But what is there, what is unique for ICU patient, is complete mechanical silence. And all cells are uh, respond to mechanical stimuli. And muscle cells are extremely uh, responsive to me mechanical stimuli. And there are mechanical sensors all the way from the extracellular matrix, uh, links uh, to the integrins and the, and, and the structural actin, intermediate filaments, all into the center of the salt mirror, where the E3 ligases respond to mechanical strain and then translocate it into the nucleus where they affect protein synthesis and regulation. And this is just an anecdotal uh, observation. This is a young boy, six years old, waiting for lung transplant. He was giving massive doses with steroids, and, <clears throat> and then he was subjected to different types of electrophysiological examinations, not the least also electroencephalography. Because he, he, didn't, he couldn't communicate, he, he became paralyzed, and the EEG uh, was diagnosed as what we call an alpha coma. So he had normal frequency, uh, alpha frequency. He was probably fully awake, he just couldn't activate any muscles. And unfortunately, later on died. So this is a post-mortem biopsy. And these are extrafusal muscle cells. And these are muscle spindles, the sensory organs inside the muscle cell, though, which are in constant tension to the gamma multiples. And these intrafusal particles, extracts myosin, but they're on the tension. And, and, and the extrafusal fibers are smaller than intrafusal, which are be at 10 or 100 times larger. So we did a simple experiment, uh, just doing unilateral mechanical loading on one, uh, in one lid and on the other. So it was actually motor driving in the active joint. It's a very, it's very mild type of activation, 30 times maximum flexion extension in the, uh, in the active joint. And we actually did the same once in ICU patients. And if you go up to 14 days, we don't have it here, actually it's 10% plus less muscle wasting on the loaded compared to the unloaded side. Muscle fiber size is increased at specific force independent if it's a fast or fish muscle. And we do the same thing and actually even tendency to less uh, uh, less reduced myosin loss. And in, in patients you can also see an effect on force genetic capacity, no effect on muscle fiber size. So I think what this tells us now, what is really important in these patients is an early intervention and aggressive type not coming in after three weeks to prevent long term factors, but actually going in day one and just passing the moments of And it's also affects many different systems. It affects this, uh, the loading. It's sort of a, this, uh, the loaders are the filter and the unloaded open bars. It affects protein degradation. It affects mitochondria, both the uh, mitophagy uh, and uh, uh, now it will disappear. It's, it's a fission and fusion. And it also has an effect on apoptosis. And it decreases the number of ITG positive effects due to the decrease.
increased amount of that, decreased the amount of protein you prepare, and also the decreased the amount of the net protein targets, just by this passive. So we think it's an important thing. And this is just showing and just defining this map model. I mean, like in the slope response, we have this preferential myosin mode, which is much less severe in the cranial friction process. We have the same pattern in the rats as in the, in the pigs as well as in the, in the, in the, uh, in the patients. We think this is a good model. At least I think we've done the ground work so we can look at time result changes and they will read it also going to interventions. But before I go to that, I'd like to talk about this ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction. And as I said earlier before, mechanical ventilation per se, it may be the most difficult to trigger to uh, underlie this uh, impaired diaphragm. And this is also what uh, what makes it possible for the patient to uh, how quickly you can wean the patient out of the bed. And this is maybe not the only one, but it's uh, after what I think diaphragm is the muscle that anesthesiologists is very interested in. This is what determines how quickly you can wean the patient out of the bed. And 40% of the time in the bed is due to uh, bleeding process. And then there's a group of patients that stay on the bed. And this accounts for about 30% of ICU costs. Or in the US, about $58 billion annually. So it's not a trivial uh, economic problem, and it's not trivial for the patient either, of course. And we look on the, on the, on the respiratory muscle, it's, different, it's, a, it's a different process. I mean, we see the same thing that the, the collective uh, decline in diaphragm function is about 85% after two weeks mechanical. So the residual function is less than 50%. But the, the, there's only a modest decline in, in, in myosin, and there's no transcription down regulation, there's activation of the proteolytic pathways. So what is the reason underlying this? We still think it's related to myosin, at least in port, and we think it's protein modification is affected, induced by the ventilation. And that is supported by the increased amount of carbon relations in the, in the diaphragm because of the fat accumulation, mitochondrial dysfunction. And we also have evidence that there are specific myosin modification. By doing single cell x ray diffraction analysis, Brahma spectroscopy, even in the aspect of So if you, if you remember, we talked a little bit about the heat proteins in the beginning. And there is a great class of new uh, pharmacological agents called chaperone points, which is not very related to each of protein 70, 72 in particular. And we have tried this drug, PTT50. It does other things than in the upgrade each of proteins. It hits this uh, one activity, the membrane stabilizer. It also includes mitochondria, or we have other functions as well. It's a drug that was originally designed to treat patients with type 2 diabetes. <coughs> and it's been in clinical trials. So far, no serious side effects. And uh, we have tried this drug in the lab model. And then look specifically in the diaphragm. This is from the previous uh, machine we did control different uh, times of uh, mechanical ventilation. We did read it 10 days. And this is the uh, uh, cross section area with BDP 15, no major effect. But force generating capacity increased almost twice. 100% improvement in force generating. And if we talked about this before, so we also want to go down to the protein level. And also, here you can see it didn't affect catalytic properties, but it formed more than double the force generating capacity of myosin. Really showing that actually this drug is the protecting myosin for protein modifications. And this is also supported by this is one modification simulation. Uh, 10 days mechanical ventilation with DDP15 and a drug specifically myosin, but also there are many other modifications as well determined by uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, and it includes oxidation, deanidation, carbonization, and this is a myosin only. But of course, DDP15 has other effects. And just private data that we have from um, Brahma's spectroscopy also has an effect on, on mitochondria. It protects from some modifications, but not. So this is where we are at at the moment, and uh, what our primary focus right now, I think we have done, we have a relatively stable platform to stand on, and what we're doing now is trying different types of fundamental interventions. We've almost done with the BGP-15, we tried to uh, finish up another one, which I'm going to present tomorrow in TC, and also starting up another project right now. And 
And we provide a role is also to translate from a single interaction to a very, very well uh, situated to do so. Because uh, um, I have my, uh, I do one day work in the clinic and the rest of them I'm in that uh, the physiology of pharmacology. And also the good thing is uh, anesthesiology also belongs to the physiology of pharmacology, for instance. So a very close interaction there. So I think, we, and they have also a very good system for the doing clinical trials in the ICUs. And as I showed, the uh, ICU will be the dominating, one of the dominating uh, areas in our new group for this hospital. We're actually starting this week to move to the new hospital. So um, we also try to improve the uh, diagnostics and monitoring. And so what I do every time I go to do the electric I also take a small biopsy, put on the device and ratio, which I think is the best way of diagnosing these patients. But we also try to miniaturize this. We we'll use a new type of um, biopsy needle. We only get about five milligrams of muscle tissue, but that's enough. And actually, for a full minute, we look on the isometric ratio with this needle, uh, with the percutaneous biopsy. If we don't get about patients, and the oral spray is 0.98. I think that's good enough. And uh, so, uh, this, is a, this is a manual intervention. So, it is comparable with the needle in the excavation or intramuscular injection. This will also make it possible to do more temporal changes in the protein degradation pathways at protein synthesis in ICU patients only. So this is something that's going on. And also coming back to our original love is quite understand as having a unique. Because the two factors that predict uh, mortality and morbidity in the ICU most strongly is muscle waste taking and muscle age. And they are of course changing. Before ending, I'd like to thank of course the group that worked there. There have been some changes in this situation. I guess some of you know very well. I'm very proud that you joined us in Sweden. It's been there now for about five years. He's enjoying life very well. We see him in the back every now and then as well. So, so actually when I after moving back from Kansas State, I set up this Mountain Day. Very much with his help just to be four years together. And I've also had a very flat place in another round two rats in Tatum, which doesn't sound much like that, but for us it's a major issue. And I'm also very fortunate to have a number of international collaborations. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. 
long as it's worthwhile. As at least by some been said to actually for advice primarily for the for the definition. And of course the worthwhile is it is the one that's most it's the earliest one to operate. And it's actually it's not only about the analysis. We did this work together, together with Matthias of the Of course, we see the upregulation, but as Matthias said, it's not only about levels, it's also about location. And actually, we're going to transfer the case from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And then, again, the transfer case out from the nucleus out from the cytoplasm in, in a chapter of sequence. And this has actually been shown in the form as well. And then, we interpret that actually the nerve goes in, affects the uh, transcriptional regulation, and then goes out and attacks the protein. And that could, of course, be a mechanism by, by mice and also the differential tool. And have these studies affected treatment in ICU units uh, mechanical ventilation? Is that uh, with the drug, you mean? Yes. Yeah, that's something we've in the process of trying to do. The problem is actually the pharmaceutical company that actually is responsible for this drug is MG. It's a very small company with very limited. Uh, financial resources. And um, we're trying to get it registered in Sweden, but then they have to produce it in Europe. Otherwise it's not uh, it will not be allowed to get it through the FDA and so on. And so far they are not produced. Which I'm, I'm very sad about. So, but um, so that's where we stand on now we're going to different types and I, I we don't have the luxury that's it in way. So now we're going to find the interventions. Another intervention we have stored it which I think is really interesting. Upstream of the effects immediately to the team. And it's actually on this JAP 1 and 2 path. So that's a specific inhibitor that we get from the company because something has gone to the And that one I think can go more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, if you take somebody who is bedridden due to injury or due to surgery, can you comment on how fast? Significant muscle wasting occurs, and then how that relates to age, so how that changes as people become elderly. Mm -hmm. I can only speculate. I don't really know. Uh, first of all, I think there's a big difference between ICU patients and bed rest. Because bed rest, bed ridden people, they're still moving their legs. There's a deep positional contact with proteins, they're still in front of when I talk about mechanical science, there's no weight bearing, and there's no internal strength in the of the That's something you don't see behind them. Suspension is and people who are rest up in space, they're still activating the muscles. So there's a different mechanism. There you'll never see it with actual muscles. And it's the same with, with bad rest. I think it's actually quite uh, mild the muscle wasting all the time. When I was here at Penn State, if I remember, we submitted an R1 actually to do uh, bed rest in GCRC in other patients. It, it was not funded, but uh, someone else could have later on. I don't really know the outcome of this. Uh, so it, it wasn't really an answer to your question. So it's the only time after that I know. I think it was a question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, so are you saying that uh, muscle weakness and wasting is a, a major factor in um, successful completion of chemotherapy and, and survival, let's say, among breast cancer patients. Yeah, the patients with cancer that develop the cancer, and they don't, uh, they don't respond to chemotherapy with that way. It's about 30% of these patients. And then there's the primary cause for mortality is the uh, patient with cancer. So it's, uh, if it's, uh, I can't say if it's breast cancer in specific, uh, but I think it's at least in some types of cancer. It's, uh, it's sometimes overlooked upon, but it's actually muscle is playing a very important role in many different diseases. It has, for tradition, been looked at as an effector work. Uh, uh, and sort of, a, I get a little bit emotional, I think, a bit. Actually, new scientists have been thinking it. it's a bit stupid. It's a very simple work. In my mind, it's the most complex cell we have in the human body. It's a cell that can contain, contain up to 1,000 nuclei. No one has any idea how they are uh, how they control. And they're not the same in the, in the myotendinous junction or in the neuromuscular junction and the rest of the body. It, it, it's an hormone producer. 
with both the exocrine, paracrine, and anocrine protection. And uh, there is also playing a very important role in depression, for instance. I think the whole pathway, as was recently described in a thing that was in the cell paper, it's actually collaborating with two of us there. So uh, it's about uh, it's an enzyme that has affected the protein that is transmitted in more case up to the, to the brain as well. So there it is. And also, there is no muscle that is the other in the brain. They are all different. It's not only about slow and fast and so on. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, we have all these the inherited types of myopathies. And the gene that affects in every muscle, but maybe it's only two muscles affected in all of the body. So uh, it tells you a little bit about the complexity. And of course, um, by chemists, as you can ask, so that I mean, I said, so just grinding down and taking out things. But it is an extremely complex tissue. And doing much more than just getting everything forced in it. Which I think is what makes it a very interesting.